to look beyond this world to the glory of the world to come. So he says, is it Christ Jesus who died? Yes, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Now, if the form of that is intended as a question, then obviously it's a kind of rhetorical question to which the implied answer is yes, right? Yes. Yes, it is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, it is Christ Jesus who was raised. Yes, it is Christ Jesus who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. And with that line, we see, I suspect, one reason why this passage was chosen for the second Sunday of Lent. Notice it's one, one of these passages in the writings of the apostles, whether Peter or Paul or John, that gives a summary statement, almost a kind of a creedal statement of the Paschal mystery, right? The Paschal mystery of Jesus' passion, death, resurrection, and, don't forget it, the ascension. Very important. When we talk about the Paschal mystery, it's easy to just reduce it to either Jesus' passion and death, which took place on Passover, or his passion, death, and resurrection, right? Because they're tightly joined in time, right? Over the course of the Triduum. But it's very important to remember that according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, traditional teaching, as well as according to the scriptures, when you look at the teachings of the apostles, they often will conjoin um, the passion, death, and resurrection to the mystery of the ascension, which takes place 40 days later. These things are all linked together as part of one great Paschal mystery. The Catechism actually says that. So we tend to forget that the ascension of Jesus into heaven is part of the Paschal mystery, but Paul didn't forget it, and the early church didn't forget it, and, and the, the Catechism doesn't forget it as well. And one reason it's important not to forget the ascension is because of what Paul says here, that Christ, who is at the right hand of God, intercedes for us. He intercedes on our behalf. So we'll see uh, the Apostle John in 1 John say this in a different way. He'll say that we have an advocate with the Father, right? Christ Jesus, who intercedes for us. So um, this emphasis on the intercession of Christ is meant to, again, encourage and give hope to the readers of Romans that even in the face of suffering and death, um, even in the face of persecution, trials, being condemned by others, as members of the body of Christ, Christians have a really great advocate. They've got a really great lawyer. Their lawyer, right, who's going to intercede for them with the judge, who is the father, is Jesus Christ himself, who died for them and for their salvation. So imagine just, I mean, just to kind of put the whole legal context of uh, Paul's words here in mind, the implied juridical context, imagine that you were being brought to a royal, being brought to a court, an earthly court, to be tried for some crime of which you were innocent, right? And you've been brought before the, the judge and, and the jury and um, you're led into the courtroom and you're wondering, well, who's going to represent me? Who's going to be my lawyer? Who's going to be my advocate? And in walks Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, and sits beside you as your lawyer, right? As your advocate. You should rest easy then. If Jesus Christ is your intercessor, if Jesus Christ is the one who's going to plead for you and who's going to make the case for you to be declared righteous rather than to be condemned, then you have nothing to fear. And that's the imagery that Paul here is using to describe the great, the Paschal mystery. So, um, short passage, but pretty rich, and I would just encourage you to ponder that with a couple of quotes from the living tradition. Because if you look at how the fathers and doctors of the church read this passage, one of the things that they did with it is they, they paused and they pondered the mystery of something I think we don't think about as often as we should, namely the mystery of the ascension and the mystery of Jesus' role as our intercessor. Jesus' role as our intercessor. Now, Catholics are very comfortable and familiar with thinking of Mary as our intercessor. But according to the New Testament, Christ is the supreme intercessor for us with the Father. And so here's a couple of quotes from the tradition you can, that can kind of flesh this out. The first is from St. John Chrysostom, my favorite. I love, I love St. John. Um, I love his homilies on Paul. They're just my favorite treatments of Paul in the tradition. And in his homily on Romans, this passage for today, St. John Chrysostom said this, quote, 
Christ did not merely die for us. He now intercedes on our behalf as well. The only reason why Paul mentioned intercession was to show the warmth and the vigor of God's love for us. For the Father is also represented as beseeching us to be reconciled to him. That's his homily on Romans number 15. So notice that. What is Christum emphasizing? We need to remember that Christ did not just die for us on the cross. He also intercedes for us now. He ascended into heaven in order to be seated at the right hand of the Father and intercede for us. And both acts, his passion on Good Friday and his ascension on Ascension Thursday, they both reveal his charity. He dies for love of us, but he didn't just love us back then. He continues to love us now in the present as he sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us out of charity. Powerful, beautiful, beautiful passage from St. John Chrysostom. And then again, Pope Leo the Great. Pope Leo the Great, in one of his letters, mentions this passage in this mystery. And this is what he says, quote, If the true high priest does not atone for us, using the nature proper to us, and the true blood of the spotless lamb does not cleanse us, then a true priesthood and true sacrifices do not exist in any other way in God's church, which is the body of Christ. Although he is seated at the right hand of the Father, he performs the sacrament of the atonement in the same flesh which he assumed from the Virgin Mary. End quote. Leo the Great, letter number 80. Now, that is a fascinating passage because what is it saying? Pope Leo is putting his finger on the fact that if we don't understand the mystery of the ascension, then we won't understand the mystery of the sacraments either. Um, and the reason is very simple. In the ascension, what Jesus does is he takes the sacrifice that was performed out of charity, out of love, in time on Calvary, and he brings that offering of himself that takes place on Good Friday in time and space, he brings it into eternity, right? He enters into the eternal now of the Father, and he offers himself to the Father on our behalf once and for all time. So that's what he means when he says he performs the sacrament of the atonement in the same flesh that he assumed from the Virgin Mary. So the ascension of Jesus is essential. Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't pass that up. The ascension of Jesus is essential because it teaches two very important truths. First, that the incarnation didn't stop with the death and resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus rises from the dead on Easter Sunday, the body that he has is the same body. That's why it's got the wounds. But it's in a glorified state. And he takes that flesh, that glorified flesh, into eternity and sits at the right hand of the Father bodily. Right Before the incarnation, the second person of the Trinity, the Word, is pure spirit. He doesn't have a body. But after the incarnation, he assumes a human nature. And after the ascension, he takes that human nature, which is now glorified, that flesh, into eternity. Right, to sit at the right hand of the Father in the flesh. And therefore, the sacrifice that he accomplishes in the flesh on Good Friday is now being perpetually offered to the Father for all eternity. And that's why we can refer to the Mass as a sacrifice. Right? One of the reasons uh, Martin Luther called the idea of the Mass as a sacrifice blasphemous well, because was because he understood that to imply that we were re-sacrificing Jesus, right? When every, every time the Mass was offered, as if the death of Jesus on Calvary wasn't enough and it had to be repeated. But what Luther didn't understand, and what Leo does understand, is that this, in the sacraments, in the Eucharist, for example, Christ is not being re-sacrificed. There's only one sacrifice. That's the sacrifice of Calvary. But that one sacrifice has been brought out of time into eternity, and now every earthly offering of the Eucharist is a participation in the one sacrifice of Christ, which he continues to offer to the Father for all time in the heavenly sanctuary, in the heavenly tabernacle, in the heavenly temple. So the ascension is the essential link between the earthly paschal mystery and the heavenly reality in which we now participate in the sacrament. That's how the self-offering of Jesus that takes place on Good Friday can come to us today on every altar, on every, uh, in every Catholic church throughout the world. What Leo is saying here is that two things. First, 
in the ascension of Jesus into heaven, the mystery of the incarnation doesn't cease. That, that's what this reveals to us. That, that the eternal word is still united with human nature right now. Jesus still has his human body, his flesh and bone. It's in a glorified state, a mysterious state to be sure, but it's the same body. That's why he has the wounds that he brings up into heaven. But it's not just the incarnation that doesn't cease with the ascension. It's not just that there's a perpetual incarnation. It's that there's also a perpetual atonement, right? So the atonement that is inaugurated and consummated on Calvary doesn't stop there. But Christ brings the atoning sacrifice into heaven so that there's a perpetual atonement taking place. And one reason this is fascinating to me as a scholar of early Judaism is that in the first century AD, there was a sacrifice in the temple called the Tamid, the perpetual sacrifice. Every morning, every evening, every morning, every evening, they would offer a sacrifice to God the Father as a, as a renewal of the everlasting covenant. So the ascension reveals to us that the, as Leo calls it, the mystery of the atonement is still being performed to this day. Now you might be thinking, well, hold on, Dr. Petrie, are you suggesting Jesus suffers in heaven? No, 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 no. The suffering ceases, all right? Jesus ceased suffering when he gave up his spirit on Good Friday. So you could put it this way, Jesus is not still suffering, but he is still offering in heaven, okay? Because he's still offering himself to the Father in love, right? For, and he will offer himself to the Father in love for all eternity, because that's what the Son does. And so the mystery of the ascension is the mystery of human nature being caught up into the eternal love of the Son for the Father and the eternal offering of himself to the Father by the Son in the Spirit.